Hi and welcome to the Bruce Channel. I'm Bruce and we're glad you could join us and it's been quite a week in quite a few ways. New sets, staff editions, we're now in HD, lots of stuff to talk about so maybe click pause and grab a cup of coffee or tea or depending what time it is when you watch maybe a beer or a martini. Except with football of necessity occupying a good part of today's show, maybe the beer. Not chronologically, they played Monday but we have to go there first to the Ohio State Buckeyes winning the first ever college football playoff. Yeah, I'm a Buckeye, so it's a terrific week. There are so many storylines. I could stay on the topic through this show, next week's show, the one after that. I won't, but here are a few highlights. For fun, I looked up where they ranked week by week. Preseason, they were number five, and that was generous, I thought, given that they graduated so many of last season's key players. Even the coach, Urban Myers, said, before the season, he thought they were about a year away. They did have two-time Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year, Braxton Miller, returning, and he was supposed to be a favorite for the Heisman. So what happens? He injures his shoulder about a week and a half before the first game, and he's out all year. That news dropped them to eight, and then after the second game when they lost, and they looked bad losing, they dropped like a rock. One poll had them as high as 18, another had them 23rd, that's almost unranked. Then as the replacement quarterback, JT Barrett got a sea legs. They gradually rose in the rankings, rose in the rankings, but at the end, this, this was the first year for the playoff system, and under the old system, they wouldn't have gotten to play for the championship. It would have been Alabama against Florida State. Which begs the question, <laughs> since the old BCS system's highest two both lost their first games, how many other years did they have it wrong, like when Boise State went undefeated but was left out? Anyway, after the selection committee announced the four seeds, ESPN Snarky Mark May, Snarky, I love that, Snarky Mark May, who's a real stinker. He badmouths the Bucks and the Big Ten in general. It really cuts them down, so he hates the committee's choices. After the game, the Buckeyes seeded number four won. Everybody in the media, except the Snark, was generous. The players, the coaches from both, in fact, all four teams, everyone was complimentary of each other, which is as it ought to be. Finally this, in an editorial in Raleigh's News and Observer, they asked the question, hey, why did it take so long to do something so obvious? And then they put forth the argument that the playoff should be expanded to eight teams. That's an argument I made a few weeks ago. They say, it's an easy solution. Drop one game from the schedule but it's the bowl contracts that makes it difficult to resolve. I think they will one day, but it's not easy. Okay, on to the pros, and in a word, redemption. <laughs> From only one right two weeks ago, three out of four came in. I missed Denver hosting Indianapolis, and I knew early, watching the game, I knew early which way it was going. I previously cited Peyton Manning's poor playoff record, but as I watched, I found myself thinking, wow, this is his last game. He's going to retire. And of course, everyone else has been asking the same thing for the same reasons. His pass has wobbled. He wasn't accurate. And I've got to believe he's got too much pride to hang on too long. We have seen that hanging on too long in all sports. It's just so awfully difficult to walk away from something you love. And in Manning's case, he'd earn $15 million next year. It will be a difficult decision. With Broncos coach John Fox now the ex-coach, it might make his decision easier or more difficult. Depending who's hired, if the new coach brings in a new offensive coordinator, and thus inherently another system to learn, I think that would be the tipping point for Manning to retire. Last word on that. I learned that Peyton's dad, the great Archie Manning, is resigning from the College Bowl Selection Committee for health reasons. So who knows? Maybe the bad game was because his mind was on his dad. Okay, to this week's picks. I think Indianapolis is a year or two away from where they want to be. And I also think that Tom Brady is a year or two, or three or four, <laughs> away from having retirement thoughts. But it's this year, so I'm sticking with my pick of New England to represent the AFC. However, Two weeks ago, I picked the Packers in the NFC. It is still very hard to go to the Super Bowl twice in a row, so Seattle has the weight of history against them. But like Ohio State, they are cresting at just the right time. I might still go with Green Bay, except Aaron Rodgers' calf injury is more serious than originally thought. 
last week I called him gimpy, but the injury is apparently one that typically takes a couple of months to recover from. So given that a big part of Rogers' success has always been his ability to extend the play, not that he's a running quarterback, but he had mobility. Given that his mobility is limited, and given that the Seahawks are peaking at the right time and playing at home, and given that the Packers running back, Eddie Lacy, has a sore knee, I think the combination is just too much to overcome. So, as I see it, the Super Bowl will be from sea to shining sea, Seattle to New England. Okay, some quick words about the movie I was in, Samka. One, the sneak preview is scheduled for next month, and yeah, I'm excited, looking forward to it. And two, it is officially in the can. That happened over last weekend when the final touches to the score were added to the film. Of course, it's always that way because the music has to fit the various scenes' length and until the final editing is done, how long is it? The music was scored by singer-songwriter Matt Busick and he has put some of that Samka music up on his own website, mattbusick.com. Pay a visit. You may find it interesting. And we'll be back. Hey, let me tell you about my book, Shrink. Or wait, I can let others do it. Remember, you can write to us at the Bruce Channel at yahoo.com and see all previous shows at tinyurl.com slash Bruce Channel. I hope you'll subscribe, and I hope you'll like. All right, music time. I've said of some of the songs I've introduced here that they were among my favorites. You know, if I'm not pleased with the way it turned out, it's probably not going to be here, so that shouldn't surprise. But this one today is different. It's one of my two best, and I, I don't say that synonymously with favorite. Both of them are different from most of the others, but this one, this one is structurally minimalistic. I use lots of instruments, but this one has no bridge and no repeating chorus. Instead, just three simple verses. Verses that I, I think may universally resonate. See, I can think of nothing worse than war. Sometimes war is necessary. If one examines history, most times it hasn't been. I further believe that while war is sometimes necessary, it should be the last, the absolute last, used option. Afghanistan? We were attacked. Afghani leaders wouldn't turn over bin Laden. So yeah, we had to go. Iraq? Weapons of mass destruction or not, I was opposed for a very simple reason. Unlike previously conducted UN inspections, in the time leading up to our invasion, the inspectors were there on the ground, and this time they were granted access everywhere, even the places previously forbidden. That isn't the point. War ruins lives, soldiers' lives, civilian lives, and it doesn't matter whose uniform or which side. Every warrior on every side of every conflict of every war left a mother, a father, a wife, a sweetheart, and everyone, everyone whose lifeblood drained into the earth or stained the sea, was then mourned by the ones at home. Their hearts were rent, open forever, bleeding a sorrow from, from which there could never be recovery. And the wives, husbands, sweethearts, parents, and siblings of everyone ever gone to war has shared this thought. Whether sent to God, or to Jesus, to Allah, the Good Lord, to Vishnu, Brahman, Elohim, or any other name, or even to a source not so well defined, the thought is always the same. Send him safely home.
Send him a light When there's dark all around And please keep him cool When the sun bakes the ground And guide all his footsteps all along the way and grant him sweet dreams when the stars are at play when there's unrest help him stay in the calm With your great healing balm Show him your presence So he might never, never need fear And when he feels alone Let him know always first on my mind Only after his needs Would I ask you to hear mine And you know it's not easy Greeting each morning all alone I hope you liked it. If so, I guess this wouldn't be one for Bruno or Michael or Rod, but if you live next door to say Taylor Swift, get her to watch it. And I hope the upcoming week is the best one you've ever had.